What's up, FC? Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. So glad you're here today. Even if you're your first time, we're so glad you're here and everybody's here. Hey, it is hot outside. Can I get a witness? And that's why that this month, June, is going to be ice cream for after every service. So be sure to go get you some after this service. Enjoy that because we want to share that with everybody here because ice cream makes things feel like a little bit, feel a little bit better. You agree with me on that? Also, do you guys know what two weeks from today is? Yes, yes, yes. So, and Father's Day is a big deal around here just like it is for Mother's Day. So I want to just challenge you, dads, you be here. If you can get your dad, get your dad here. We're going to celebrate dads in a creative, compelling experience with God on that day. And I tell you what, we're going to bring back something we had last year that was an amazing hit. And if you're not here, you're not going to know what that was. So anyway, with that being said, let's give some early love to the, all the dads in the house. Excited, excited, excited. Hope and pray you'll come and be a part of that experience with us here at Freedom Church. So, we've been in a series called The Struggle is Real. And the struggle is real, especially when it comes to technology. And I'm just simply sharing through this series how that we need to find balance in our lives because we want to leverage technology. We want to do that. We leverage technology. Y'all give some love to the people watching online right now. Give them some love. We want to leverage technology for God's glory, but we don't want technology to dominate our lives. The first week in this, uh, in talking about technology, uh, I talked about contentment. If we're not careful about technology, it'll cause us to be so self-focused and we begin to covet other people's stuff. And the second week we talked about relationships, how that technology can be damaging to a face-to-face, -face, a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. Last week, Pastor Chad talked about authenticity. You guys give him some love. He knocked it out of the park. Yes, appreciate Pastor Chad, our student pastor. This week, today, I'm going to talk about care and compassion. But before I jump into that, you don't want to miss the wrap-up next Sunday. Uh, I'm going to talk about rest. Now, one thing I know for sure is that all of us here are probably in the same boat as I'm going to share with you. How many of you will agree with me as, as this technology has grown in all areas of life, how many of you here are like me, you feel like you're tethered to technology? Would you raise your, raise your hand? Feel like you're tethered to it? Well, that's what I want to talk about next week, and it's going to be amazing what we're going to talk about in the wrap-up, talking about rest from that. So today, social media can help us with care and compassion. It can raise awareness about things that's going on. As you look at social media in particular, you find out about different ministries, you find out about different nonprofits and how that they can raise money and that's a good thing to be able to have. I remember, how many of you are here were a part of the ice water bucket challenge kind of deal? How many of you did that? Raise your hand. Man, I did that too. Next time, I'm just gonna say, I'll write the check, bro. I ain't dumping ice water on me. I am over that deal. You know, how many of you here have ever given to a GoFundMe? You've seen GoFundMe's. I think a lot of people, there are good GoFundMe's. But, everybody say but. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Here it is. Social media and technology can also hinder our level of care and compassion. You say, what do you mean by that? Technologies, plural, cause less compassion. It does that on social media, it even does that on TV, it does that on computer. Care and compassion is declining due to the constant overexposure. You follow what I'm saying? It's, it's just a constant bombardment of overexposure. And there's a few things I think that causes that. We have become, become selfie-centered. I mean, that's what we have become. You say, well, what do you mean selfie-centered? What I'm talking about is we become more obsessed with ourselves. Selfies have become a part of especially this current culture. The younger generation, you guys, you've never known any different than to have selfies on your phone. For me and the older crowd, it's something that we became acquainted to. It became part of our DNA, and it became part of a, it was a paradigm shift for us. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that there's people in this auditorium and there's people watching online, you've never turned a camera on yourself. You may have never taken a selfie, but you have to understand this. And I want to teach you something about those that do selfies. There's not just one kind of selfie. There's not. 
I examined I examine myself this week over the past years of being on social media. And there's all kinds of selfies. And I become selfie infected. And so I picked out 10 of them to tell you there's all kinds of different selfies. The first one is this. It's me and mine. That's me and mine. That's my beloved selfie. Pound, chicka, pound. Now she mine. Okay. Here's another selfie. Check this out. Me and my collie, dog. His name is Rhett Butler. He's a lover, not a fighter. Next selfie. That's a pet selfie. They do that. This is a bad day when I woke up that way. That is a bad day. And then, how about this in here? Hey, that's me and some friends at the Preds game. We got great seats and you're not there, selfie. Right? Okay. How about this? Next one here. This is the cute calf selfie. You ever had a cute calf selfie? That's what that is. How about this next one here? This one right here is me preaching to you beautiful people at Freedom Church selfie. Took that the first week that we started this series. The next selfie here. This is me and my grandson's selfie. Loving on my boys there, you know. How about this next one? This is me not wanting to catch the funk on an airplane selfie. Also, what's really cool about that, when you got that mask on, there ain't nobody going to sit beside you. Trust me, brothers and sisters. They thinking this guy's dying. Seriously. How about this next selfie here? That is the silly selfie, right? The silly selfie. I've been told I got a big mouth. I proved it there. How about this next? I, I, wait, this is right here is the sickest selfie of all. This is me and Chloe in a face swap selfie. That is sick. I mean, they need to take that down right there. That looks like a brother and sister married each other. <laughs> Telling you what, man, that's some bad stuff. You know, it's all fun, but the truth is we have become selfie-centered. And that's the truth. We have become obsessed with self. The majority of social media users that use it, it relates to the user. When you get on social media, it's what you're interested in. It's who has liked your pic or who has commented your post. And what that does when you see that, it releases a chemical in your brain called dopamine, which is basically getting you a legal high. It's like we're training ourselves to be self-focused. So we have become selfie-centered. Something else that's causing compassion to go down through technology is that we become desensitized to the suffering of, of, of other people. You say, well, what do you mean? The more pain we see, the less we care. You say, what do you mean? An example. How many of you here have saw the commercial with Sarah McLachlan with her song in the arms of an angel about the suffering dog situation? How many of you saw that commercial? The, a whole lot of you, probably the majority of you. You know what? That commercial don't even bother me anymore. I saw it so much. It's not that I don't care about suffering animals. I love animals. But it doesn't get to my goat anymore. They play that song of hers so they can get you emotional so you'll get out your debit card. I'm just being honest. That's what it does. But that doesn't even affect me any longer. Not that I don't want to help. If God it, it touches my heart, I'll help. But the point I'm trying to make there is, is that when, even when you get on social media, it's what you're interested in. I want you to understand that. And when you look at social media and things like that, you scroll, you get your phone out right here and you scroll through. Oh, that's a cool recipe. Oh, that's cool. Oh, ah, look at that selfie of them. Then you watch the video. Then you scroll across, oh, nine more kids killed in a school by a school shooter. Then you scroll across, oh, another uh, bomber has bombed somebody else with another thing that's going on overseas, 200 dead, whatever. It happens. The point that I'm saying is, when you have a device and it's equal on the page, ultimately it becomes equal in your mind. That's what ends up happening. Shouldn't be that way, but that's what happens. We start to care less and less. But also, technology confines our conviction of care. So what do you mean? Let's say hypothetically, you see someone on Facebook or Instagram, and they've got some kind of life-threatening disease. 
and they're posting about it. It's really easy for you to hit a like button or say I'm sorry or if you come in and say I'm praying for you and then are you going to remember really to pray for that person? But it's a whole nother ball game when that person sits across the table from you with their tear-filled eyes and they begin to tell you, I don't know if I'm going to beat this. I don't know if I'll get to walk my daughters down the aisle whenever they graduate from college and they're going to get married. I don't know if I'm going to be able to take care of my family. I don't know if I'm going to be able to mother my children. Somebody else is going to have to take my place and they're bawling their eyes out. It's easier to care from a distance, but up close. It moves your heart. It moves your heart in those moments. And it's in those moments that God wants to use you and me the most. Today as we look at 1 John 3.16 and 17, not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16 and 17. I want you to follow along with me in these, in these verses here. It says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we, ought, we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, say no compassion. No compassion. How can God's love be in that person? See, how clearly does your action say that you really love other people? How much compassion, how much godly compassion do you really have in your life at this moment? I asked you to look into your soul and ask yourself, how much godly compassion do you have? Now, when you look at the word compassion for what it's written in the New Testament Bible, the original language was Greek. And when you look at the actual true meaning of this word, it means that you ache on the inside for someone else. It means that you feel a deep sympathy for someone else to say you care for someone in their most difficult time and you do nothing about it. That is to say that you do not care at all. You see something, let's, let's just say that you're, you're, you're checking something out on, on a social platform and you see something happening bad to someone, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is, and you like it. First and foremost, if something bad is happening to them, you don't need to like it. Because they don't like it or they wouldn't have posted it. You say, well, that's just what we do. I know that. I know that's just what we do. But once again, you need to at least say, I am going to pray for you and mean it. See, caring isn't clicking. Caring isn't clicking. At least type a true prayer from the depths of your soul. Caring isn't liking the post, but caring is loving the person. Doing what you can do for them. Listen, some people care too much. You know what that's called? Love. Love. So today, I want to share a few things that you and I can apply to our lives in this technological advanced generation that we're living in. Godly passion. When you really have godly passion, it moves you into action. You say, what do you mean by that? If you look at the Gospels and you look at Jesus' life, every time that you see compassion there, it is followed by an action by Jesus, our King and our Savior. If you look at Mark's gospel in chapter 1, first example, you will see that there is a man with leprosy and he comes and kneels before Jesus and he begs Jesus to heal him. He said, if you will, if you are willing, heal me, Jesus. Make me clean. Do you understand how bad leprosy was in that environment, in that culture, in that day and time? People had, that had this terrible disease, they not only had the disease, but they were deformed by the de disease. They lost limbs, they lost fingers, they lost toes. They, they looked afflicted. And did you know that they would need to holler, unclean, unclean, somebody would come near them. And if they got very, very close, you know what the people of the day would do? They would actually pick up rocks and throw it at the lepers to tell them to keep a safe distance. The Pharisees, 
the religious people of the day would not even walk down the same street if they knew that a leper had previously walked down the street. So what was Jesus' response, especially for him, being who he was? It says in verse 41, moved with compassion. That meant that he was aching on the inside. He felt a deep sympathy for this person that had leprosy. He says, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. See, the value of a person is on the inside. It's not on the outside. This person's body was diseased. This person's body was deformed, but no less valuable to God. Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, it says in verse 14, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. He had what? What's that word? He had compassion on them and healed their sick. See, compassion moves you to action. A lot of times we say we will pray for you and hopefully you do pray for someone. But sometimes when it comes to care and compassion, the prayers get legs on it and you're moved into action. You're moved into action. In Luke's gospel, we see a story here to where that there is a woman who has lost her only son. He has died. There is a funeral procession taking place. And the only son that she had was in that coffin. Jesus, as a rabbi, wasn't even to get near the dead person. But Jesus, when he shows up, look what's happening here. In this village of Nain, out in the middle of nowhere. It says, Jesus saw the huge crowd. When, When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. No doubt. Why did he? Why was? Because she was broken. She was wailing. She was crying. Everybody are just their hearts are just so so heavy. His heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Why would Jesus say, "Don't cry"? Have you ever lost someone before, by the way of death, and someone told you, "Don't cry. It's going to be okay." No, it's not okay. It's not okay because they're gone and you're left with a separation and your heart is broken and you're overwhelmed and you just don't understand, especially when times come and you didn't expect it and death angel comes in and takes someone that you dearly love out of your life. Sometimes they'll say, they're in a better place. Yes, they may be in a better place. They may be a Christian, but you're still stuck in this place and in this shell and in this body and you're separated from it. See, this woman's future was very bleak. To say the least. See, it was her only son. And she was past childbearing age. She was too old to get married. She would be a person that could be taken advantage of by people. And to say the least with this person here, she would be reduced to begging just to stay alive if she didn't have relatives to come to her aid. So Jesus tells her, don't cry. Why did he say that? Because he went over and touched the son, raised him back to life. And when Jesus raised the young man back to life, it raised the widow's hopes back to a a great life that she could have in Jesus. And that's what he wants to do for me and you. He wants to use me and you to raise people's hopes back up through care and through compassion. The more you, you obsess over yourself, the more... You will care less about others. But the closer you get to Jesus, the less you care about yourself. Jesus said, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Dying to self, what that does, that increases your care. That increases your compassion for other people. So I want to ask you a question. When was the last time? That you dropped what you were doing in order to do something for somebody else and not expecting anything in return. When was the last time? Does it come to your mind? 
Many of you, no doubt, have done that. And I praise God for that. But let me say to you, if your memory escapes you and you cannot remember the last time, that may tell you something, that you're not as close to Jesus as what you think that you are. So godly compassion will move you into action. But also godly compassion, it will interrupt your routine. You say, what do you mean? When you look at Jesus' life in the Gospels, you will notice something. That his entire ministry for three years from the time he was baptized in the Jordan River was a ministry of interruptions. He was, in this particular story, we flip over from Luke 7 to Luke 8, and in this particular situation, he's on his way to heal a dying girl. And yes, rightly so, go, that's urgent, heal a dying girl, she's about to pass away. But then, look what happens at verse 43 in Luke 8. A woman in a crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Matter of fact, Scripture says that she spent everything she had. She had nothing left. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing against you. See, on his way here, to be able to do what God wanted him to do, Jesus was interrupted to do something else that God wanted him to do to be able to do. So through this situation and this woman coming up, she ends up confessing that it was her and he had healed the woman because he felt it go from his body. And all of a sudden now, Jesus has had an interruption that he healed a woman, but he also went and healed a little girl at the same time. God was using him in mighty ways. I asked you this question. How many of you hate like me, getting your schedule interrupted. Raise your hand. Be honest. Man, we're control freaks. We are. We're control freaks, man. We can't stand getting our schedule interrupted. And here's what I want to say to you when you think about getting interrupted. It's in those times of divine interruptions that God wants to use you the most. A while back, I had a situation. Someone approached me. And they wanted help. And man, I was tired. I was ready to go home. You ever felt like that? You just wore out. You ready to go home? And you know what I did? (laughs) In my heart, I argued with the Holy Spirit. Man, they can get somebody else to do this. You know other people. I'm not the only one. I went on and on and on, arguing with the Holy Spirit. Say, wow, I go to another church. You ain't my pastor, you know. (laughs) No, that happens to all of us because we have a wrestle between the flesh and the spirit. That's what happens to everybody. The Holy Spirit won, tell you that right now. And I did this, and I did what was in front of me. But here's something that that I want you to understand in this situation. Why did I argue with the Holy Spirit? Because we always put the judgment cap on. That's what we do. We put the judgment hat on to size people up. That's what we do. When the Holy Spirit convicts you and touches your heart and gives you divine opportunity, it's not your judgment. It's the Holy Spirit's judgment for to do what God is telling you to do. How many times do we miss divine opportunities through divine interruptions because we put on the judgment hat? Missed divine opportunities are missed due to our selfishness. I want to do what I want to do instead of being open to the interruptions of the Holy Spirit to do something else is what it boils down to. And I ask you today, will you make a decision in your life to let God interrupt your schedule for divine opportunities? Maybe you need to call someone. You know you do. They're going through a tough time. Maybe it's time that you meet with them right now, even though it's going to interrupt your schedule. Maybe the next time you see somebody that's broke down in a car on the side of the road, and you think, you know what you do? You put on a judgment cap and say, they got a cell phone. They can call anybody they want to, right? That, raise your hand if that's what you do. Fess up before God and Almighty, right? That's what we do. I'm guilty of it. That's what we do. They got a cell phone. 
They may just need to, just the fact of God getting you to stop and say a word to them. That might be the greatest encouragement that they need in that moment because they're hurting. You don't know what else is going on in their play. They might not need help with the car trouble, but they may need help with Jesus. Maybe it's a situation where it's not a, a car. Maybe you just need to open your eyes and, and be, be open to the power of the Holy Spirit to interrupt your life, to lend a hand, to be able to lift a load, to be able to just simply show you really do care and that you really do have compassion. Let the Holy Spirit interrupt you because that's what God does and God wants to work through those divine interruptions with divine opportunities to make a difference. So godly compassion will move you to action. And godly compassion will interrupt your routine, but also godly compassion will cost you. When you take a look in the scriptures here, Jesus told a story. And he talked about this story and, and leading up to the story of the Good Samaritan that most everybody, if not all of you, have heard of that. If you've not ever read it, you've heard of the Good Samaritan the Pharisees, he was having a conversation with them, and he's told them that what the greatest two commandments are, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So they say, who is my neighbor? So that's when he goes into the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and in this story, the Good Samaritan, a, a Jewish person has been beat up and left basically for dead on the side of the road, and a, and a religious priest walks by, passes him on, takes a look, keeps going. Temple assistant, same thing, walks by, passes him on, keeps on going. <laughs> But what did the Samaritan do? I know what. Let's put the rest of his name with the Samaritan, as the scripture says here. I'll pick up at Luke 10, 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt. He had an ache in his soul. He had deep sympathy. He felt compassion for him. Why could, how, could he, how could he have compassion for someone? You know why he's called a despised Samaritan? It's because the person laying on the ground that's been beaten up and left for dead hates him. They hated, the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. That's why they're called despised. And that's a whole other message within itself. But it says, going over to him, he was moved to action, right? It says that the Samaritan soothed his wounds with his olive oil and wine and bandaged him. In other words, he was on his way somewhere. He had an interruption, right? It interrupted his routine, but then it gets further. It says, then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. He, he, he. Did you see that? He put him on his own donkey, then took him to an inn, and he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins. Grab this. Telling him, take care of this man if, you, if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. See, the two silver coins means that he paid two days of his own earnings to this hotel clerk so this guy could stay there. What does that mean? Get this, two days of a man's wages to help a total stranger. Who in the world would do such a thing? Somebody filled with godly compassion. That's who does that? See, godly compassion will move you to action. Godly compassion will interrupt your routine. Godly compassion will cost you something. See, we all want to do what's easiest for us. Let's be honest with one another, not be inconvenienced. It's awful easy for me to click. It's awful easy for me to retweet. It's awful easy for me to like. It's awful easy for me to share a link. It's awful easy for me to favorite something. It's awful easy when I click it just to show a heart. Oh, you're really doing something, brothers and sisters. I bet they got knocked off her feet when they seen that heart that you did for them on that like. Wow. Cuckoos to you. Kudos. A week or so ago, I, I went to the minister's conference this week and shared there. Got to encourage some pastors on one of the sessions and preached the gospel and it was great and I was gone but right before I left my wife came to me and there is a special person in our lives that we've known I don't know how long we've known her but she's like 84 years old and her son is fighting for his life in a hospital and um, 
she has stayed in the hospital every day. And Shanda, I don't know if you know how expensive it is. There's probably many of you here, you stayed in the hospital with a loved one that you cared deeply for. It gets really expensive buying meals out every day, all day long. And Shanda come to me and she said, hey, I want to give her $100. Because my wife has the gift of giving and compassion. She has that. I said, sure. I said, that's great. You know, I said, I, I said that, yeah, she needs that. You know, she just lives on a, you know, Social Security. She don't have a, a lot, you know. So I get back from the minister's conference, and we were conversing yesterday. And uh, she said, oh, by the way, you know, I told you that, uh, that um, I gave that to Lida, but also I ran into so-and-so, and I gave them this money for this, and I also got a thing in the mail, and I gave a check for this, and also I gave this money for this. I said, what you talking about, Willis? Now, it ain't because I'm trying to be tight. We didn't discuss that situation. But you know, sometimes the greatest opportunities you have that God gives you to show care and compassion will cost you. And I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I sometimes try to talk myself out of doing something good. And I believe everybody in this room right here, if you were honest, you would say sometimes you try to talk yourself out of doing something good. Because you know it's going to cost you. You know that. See, the Holy Spirit will call upon you for your time. The Holy Spirit will call upon you for your talents. The Holy Spirit will call upon you for your treasures at some times. But you know what that ends up doing when you listen and you take heed and you move into action and it interrupts your schedule and it's going to cost you something. You get closer to Jesus. You get closer to Jesus. Maybe God's calling you to help that coworker that just really gets on your nerves because... It just seems like they're always in the valley of trouble. They don't ever get out. And you just get tired of hearing it. Or maybe there's that family member and every time something goes down in their life, they always call you. And you always you, you argue with yourself and you argue with the Holy Spirit and you think, why don't they call my, this other family member of ours? They have, they, they, are, they have more resources than I've got. They've got more time than I've got. Why don't they call them? Or maybe you see a friend on Facebook, and they've lost their job. Instead of just putting a heart on there, the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and says, Hey, why don't you help them financially? I could go on and on and on. See, clicking the like or making the comment is the easy thing to do. But godly compassion moves you to action. Godly compassion interrupts your routine. Godly compassion will cost you. But you know what it does? Godly compassion changes lives. It changes lives. See, Jesus changed lives everywhere because of his compassion. Jesus shared a story in Luke's gospel in 15, chapter 15, about three lost things. A lost coin, lost sheep, and a lost son. The father and the son's situation was this. He wanted his inheritance while the father was living. Now he could ask for it, but it was disrespectful. It was basically saying, I wish you were dead, dad. That's what he did. And he gave it to him. Scripture tells us that he went off into a far country and he spent it all. Partying and Next thing you know, he's broke, he has no friends, he has nobody, he has no resources, it's all gone. He finds himself wallowing with the swine, wallowing in the pig pen. 
which he was really bad for a Jewish person. See, he's the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son. You know what the word prodigal means? It means wasteful. And sometimes when you see another person, you think this is going to be wasted again. That's what you think. I know I've thought it and you've thought it. But then he's wallowing there in that moment. And you know what clicks in his mind? He comes to his senses, the scripture says. He thinks about his father. He thinks, man, I could go back to my father's house. I'd just like to be a servant there. I don't have to be a son. I'd just be a servant. They're a lot better off, a way better off than where I am. He's good to, to the servants. And that's where it speaks up here in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son. Er, let's park there for a second. Do you know that in the East, Jewish old men do not run? They do not run. They do not but the scripture here tells us that he ran. Why did he run? To show love and compassion for his son. It says he embraced and kissed him. See, the father had lost his son and now he's reunited. And the father had every right to say, listen, you're not welcome here. As a matter of fact, according to the Levitical law, the son should have been stoned, should have been stoned to death. That was the law. But if the neighbors started stoning them, they would have had to stone the father too because the father's fell on his son that he loves and he's embracing him and he's loving him. And he's filled with love and compassion for his son. Wow. There should have been a funeral instead of a feast in this story. See, the story really could have been called the story, the parable of a loving father. And you say, why? Because it emphasizes the love and compassion of the father more than the sinfulness of the son. What drew this young man, this young son, what drew him back home? Stay with me. This young man's memory of his father's love, the memory of his father's care, the memory of his father's compassion is what drew him back home. Dear Lord in heaven, may you and I be godly people with godly compassion that when somebody's thoughts has a memory of you and I, that it's a memory of love, of care, and compassion. So today, I, I want to ask you something, and I want you to, to take part if, it's, if it fits you. If there has been someone through this ministry or a, a, a Christian in this ministry that you met out there in the world or you met them here and they were moved to compassion in your life. They moved to action and touched your life. They, their schedule may have been interrupted or it costed them something and it changed your life and that's why you're here today and you know it because of that person that had godly compassion on you. Would you stand to your feet right where you're at? We just simply want to celebrate that. Just stand to your feet. Praise God. You can be seated just for a moment. Ah. I want to, those of you that stood, I want to speak to you first, and I want to say to you, your life was changed because of somebody's godly passion, godly compassion. Now I challenge you to be life changers with God's 
compassion in your life. And I want to say to everybody here, I want you to make up your minds that you're going to be people that are life changers with God's compassion through your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to be thinking all the time, I'm on the hunt in my life for who I have not become yet. I am on the hunt for who I have not become yet. I am on the hunt for who I have not become yet. And because of that, being on the hunt for that, we're going to be people that are going to be world changers, life changers through the the compassion of Almighty God. That's where we're going. We want people to be able to know Jesus Christ. Our very mission at this church is to reach people to know God. Jesus didn't just come to die for the lost and reach the lost. He showed love and compassion and care everywhere he went. And I want to be like Jesus. Would you stand as we pray? Heavenly Father, as we come today, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, oh God, thank you that you showed your compassionate love for each of us by coming and giving your life for us. Thank you that we get to experience your love, your care, your compassion through your Spirit. We thank you for the lives here that's been touched by those that are great examples and put into action your godly compassion. Thank you for that. God, may this be a moment that we ask you to do a mighty work in our hearts, God. As you're here and your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, there is no doubt in my heart and mind that there's many of you here that have been burned because you were caring and compassionate. I get that. But my prayer is today is that you will give God the Father permission to rekindle the fire of care and compassion in your soul and not let an instance here or there blind what God wants to do in you and through you and for the world around you. Would you say to God, God, touch my life and make me more caring and compassionate even if it interrupts my schedule, even if it cost me something. God, may I be moved to action because I want to be used to see lives changed. If that's you today, and you want God to do this in you, here in this auditorium or online, would you just slip your hand up right where you're at? Just raise your hand up right now and say, God, I need this. I need this today. Oh, God in heaven. Keep that hand up for a minute. We're going to pray. Keep that hand up. Be proud of it. Say, God, do a work in me. Heavenly Father, right now, God, thank you for the honesty of the hearts of those here that want to have you to touch their life right now, God, that they will be people that are caring and more compassionate than ever before. God, that they will be, not be blinded, God, and not be people that are less compassionate, but more and more, God, that they're going to be moved into action. They're not going to be uh, uh, just a person that's going to say, I don't want to be interrupted, but they're willing to let those divine interruptions be divine opportunities. God, even if it costs them something so lives can be changed. Bless them right now as they ask you to do that in their lives. Ask him to do that. Say, God, do that in me. All right. Put your hand down. As we continue to pray, there's no doubt the love that I feel through the moving of God's Holy Spirit in this place. And some of you being here today or even watching online, you would love to experience that love in its fullest but you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life you've never fully surrendered to him see that love that you feel you know why you feel that love and that drawing it's because God is love and it's the wooing of the Holy Spirit drawing you to his love he wants you to experience it in the fullest see Jesus came down the stairway of heaven he put on skin and he lived here 33 years and then he went to the cross And said, this is how much I love you. And spread his arms out and he died. His last blood taking care of our sin debt by him becoming sin for us. And yet on that third day, the very power that brought him out of the tomb is the very power that God can give you to live this life until you cross over to spend eternity with him. That is a great, great promise. And that is a great, great, great decision. It is the greatest decision that you'll ever make. Your decision determines your destiny. So if you feel that great void in your life and you know you've never given your life to him, 
No one look around. I want you to lift your hand right now and say, I know that I need to give my life to Jesus. That's why I'm here today. I know that. Lift your hand real high. Be proud of that decision. Be proud of that. God bless you. God bless you. I see those hands. Be proud of it. Anyone else? Raise your hand up and say, I know I need to give my heart to Jesus. I know I need to. God bless you. Hands are going up. God bless you. God bless you. Now, here's what I want you to do. Those that raise your hand, God bless you. I see the hand, ma'am, right there in front of me. Anyone else? God bless you. I see your hands. Listen, we're about to do business with your creator. So right now, as you've lifted your hands to glory, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to pray. I wish I could pray your prayer for you, but it's your prayer that gets your name in the book and gets you the peace of God and the leadership of his spirit. So right now, as we pray, would you just tell the Lord in heaven, say, Heavenly Father, I asked you to come into my heart. I open it up to you. Would you tell him, say, Lord, would you please accept me as yours? I want to be your child. I want you to be my king. I want you to be my loving heavenly father. Now, would you tell him, say, Lord, I believe it's you that's knocked on my heart. I believe you live for me, you died for me, and you arose for me. Now, this is the most important part. Tell him, say, Lord, I confess all my sins. Sin, meaning you missed the mark. I've done some things that's wrong. I ask you to forgive me of all of those sins and wrongdoing. I ask you to save me. My life is eternally yours. If you prayed that from the depths of your soul, as the Holy Spirit has led you, you just experienced a peace that passes all understanding. Feel that peace in your soul? Scripture says it's a peace that passes all understanding. So if you'll thank him right where you're at, where you made your altar, and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul, he's going to give you the power of his Holy Spirit that's going to lead you as you go out of this place. You might feel like you're in the minority walking back into your circle of life, but now, my friend, you are the majority, you and God, your creator. Let's give God praise for the changed lives in the house today. Praise his holy name today.